Okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit more of the specifics of the how. How do you actually get to this new world? What are some things? And none of this is sort of, this is, you have to do this or it won't work. Um, it's ideas, suggestions, things to move forward from. So problems with GDP. Many of you have seen some form of this list. And so it interprets every expense as positive. So oil spill, GDP goes up. Um, a divorce, GDP goes up. Cancer, GDP goes up. So even though things that decrease your well-being, GDP goes up and loves. Okay? It leaves out many components that enhance welfare. So a mom staying home to take care of her kids, or um, school education, so home education is left out. Um, having a garden and picking vegetables from your garden, GDP hates that, right? <laughs> Um, and so there's a lot of things. It loves when you go and buy a TV dinner, though, right? That's awesome. That it's not that good for your health, doesn't matter. So GDP and welfare don't go together. And very importantly, it, oh, I have a pointer. Um, very importantly, it doesn't take in distribution of income. So GDP doesn't care whether one person has all the money in the country or it's equally distributed. So this was work done by um, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett in a book called Spirit Level. And they looked at, they created this index. I don't know if you could read this, but so they, the index includes life expectancies, math and literacy, infant mortality, homicide, imprisonment, teenage birth, trust, obesity, mental illness, and social mobility. So they put that into an index. So the index is on the y-axis. And they looked at national income per person on the x-axis. And they found that there was almost no correlation. However, if they looked, did the same kind of axis, index on the y-axis, income inequality on the x-axis, they actually found that there was a really strong correlation. I think Kate said it was like 0.89. Oh, For social sciences, how many social sciences get that, <laughs> right? You know, you, so I'm an astrophysicist by training, so that's normal for me. But with the social science, if you get 0 0.3, 0 0.4, you're like, yes, there's a correlation. So this is really good. It's a really strong correlation. And many of you have seen this graph where GDP, so we're not saying don't grow GDP anywhere. Because there are certain things you need to meet basic needs. So there are people that don't have food, don't have housing, don't have water. And yes, you need money, you need GDP to gather those. However, at some point, it starts mattering. So GDP keeps going up, but in this case, it's mean life satisfaction, levels off. So if you get your first car, that's a huge increase to your well-being. If it's your seventh or eighth car, much less so. So, right? so that's what this is picking up. So we published a paper to look, basically says, time to leave GD behind. We need the next step. And so one of the things we looked at was what indicators are out there. And this is a few that are very popular, um, but there's actually hundreds out there. This, ooh, sorry. OK, so it's split up into three groups. The first group takes GDP and tries to adjust it for things um, that it does badly. So it tries to include some of the, um, takes the negatives as negatives instead of as positives, includes um, income inequality, takes into account some of the things that GDP doesn't. So that's this group. And I'll talk more about GPI. It's one indicator we've worked with. Um, the second group does sort of direct life satisfaction, so mostly surveys. It asks people what's your life satisfaction, one to 10 basis, or some version of that, usually not white worded like that. Um, a really popular one there is gross national happen, happiness, which is in Bhutan. So GNH, many of you have heard. Um, it's a survey done. The survey takes about eight hours to do. I really want them to ask the life satisfaction question in the beginning and the end and see how it differs <laughs> after an eight hour survey. Um, and the last group is 
it's kind of a composite. So it takes different components. It might be objective aspects, might be some subjective aspects, and puts it together. So for example, the Human Development Index, HDI, looks at index of um, GDP per person, spending on health and education, and life expectancy. So it just merges some of different objective indicators. So I'm going to talk about GPI. GPI um, takes a strong, com big component of um, GDP, personal consumption expenditure, and then adjusts it by about 24, 25 categories. One is income distribution. Um, and it basically adjusts that. And oh, sorry, wrong button. It also adds certain things that have been left out and then subtracts other. The colors um, are right here, so natural capital, social capital, human capital, and built capital. Um, it's not a perfect indicator in any way. There's a lot of problems with this indicator. There's a big international group working on uh, GPI 2.0 to deal with some of these problems, and even that won't be perfect. There is no perfect indicator, but neither is GDP. And so this is at least one step further. And so if you look at GPI for the US, you see that GPI kind of bubbles along while GDP grows quite significantly. And that split happens in about 1978. And we found that um, looking at what created that separation, the two big factors were cost of inequality and cost of environmental damages were the two big ones. So we looked at actually about 17 countries. <clears throat> at that point, that's all there was. There's about another five or six more. Um, these 17 countries made up about 63% of the global population, about 68% of the global GDP. Um, so it was a majority, but not all. The only continent we left out was Africa. It wasn't intentional. There's GP, GPI hasn't been calculated in Africa. So once it is, we're working on one in South Africa, we'll include it in this. But so we basically took and indexed it to 1990, and we looked at various indicators. So GDP per capita is the blue, GPI per capita is the red, um, ecological footprint, social, bio capacity, which is sort of an inverse of ecological footprint, kind of, life satisfaction, which is a survey, and HDI. And you can see the difference. So GDP goes up, GPI goes up for a while, and then levels off. And we saw this trend in almost every country you looked at. There were exceptions, of course. Um, a lot of the exceptions were when there was a major policy change. Um, for example, a major tax on the rich, which reduced inequality. We saw that GPI changed. Um, but in most countries, so for example, in China, same thing. GDP grows really quickly. While GPI grows till about 1995, they track, and then they split off. Don't have any further data since then, but we're working on it. And so if you look at the 70 countries we looked at, GDP, there's a general trend, upward trend. While GPI, much less of a trend. So GPI goes up for a while, and then various things happen, levels off does big dip, this is Poland with the big dip. So there's various things that happen um, policy-wise that can change it. And if you put all these together um, on the global level, you see the same trend. GDP keeps going up, GPI at about 1979, 1980, it levels off. And so it's what Herman Daly calls economic growth and uneconomic growth, basically. Where we're, the economy is growing, but it's uneconomic. And then if you look at GPI and GDP, you see that it's around 7,000 GDP per capita. I forgot the per capita. Imagine it's there. Um, but basically, it's about seven, dollars $8,000 per capita. So, and that just happened to be out of those 70 countries we looked at. It may definitely change, go up or down as we look at more countries. And so there are some government um, governments that are using GPI as an official indicator. So Maryland was the first. Um, Maryland created, basically, it was an amazing website. The previous government really liked it. And he basically argued they still calculated GDP. But one, one um, year, GDP went down. And the governor released the press release saying, you know what? It's OK, because jobs went up. Green spaces went up. Overall, well-being is better, even though GDP went down. 
So G G it's okay. And Vermont soon followed, but the problem with Maryland is because the, it was a government um, governor initiative. As soon as the governor was not reelected, the initiative really disappeared. While in Vermont, they actually added it as part of their constitution. So no matter what happens to the government there, it will be calculated in some way. So, um, and there are other states that are talking about it. Utah, Hawaii, Colorado's talking about it, and about five more um, that are trying to implement it as well. This is a paper we recently published um, talking about modeling and measuring sustainable well-being in a connection with the SDGs. And you've heard about the SDGs. And one of the things we're talking about is that you do need an interactive model. So the SDGs right now are independent 17 goals. But you need to know what the trade-offs are. You do need to know how they interact, how they work together. And so one of the suggestions that a group has been working with the UN is to use a ver ver variation of GPI to do that. Um, and that would have to add some of the things that it's missing and correct some of the issues that it has. But that's one of the discussions. There's also a lot going on in the business world. So, and Hunter knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, but one group that we've worked with is True Cost. Um, True Cost basically tries to look at the actual cost and impact that a company has on the environment. They published this report, which basically says the primary production and primary process sector analyzed in this study are estimated to have unpriced natural capital costs totaling about $7.3 trillion, which equates to 13% of the global economic output in 2009. That's massive. So there is stuff happening in those business world. Puma, for example, um, had True Cost um, do a big report seeing what its environmental damages are, and a lot of other companies are doing the same. We're working on a project with the National Australian Bank. Um, so the Australian Bank is part of the Natural Capital Declaration, which is a group of organizations, banks, so on, saying that they will take into account natural capital when they do business. Oops, sorry. And what, nat and what NAB is doing, it's a really cool project, in that what they want to do is look at degradation of land, especially with agriculture. So if a farmer is degrading their land significantly, they might have a hard time getting loans, or if they get a loan, their interest rate will be really high. And if they're taking care of their land really well, so not um, creating erosion, um, not polluting their waters, their interest rates will be really low. And so the goal there for the bank is risk management. Because honestly, in the end of the day, do they care about environment? Probably to some extent. But their first focus is money. We know that usually is the case. In Australia, there is no strong agricultural insurance industry like in the US. So the banks actually are the backstop. They're the insurers. And so when there's a drought, on a good year, when there's enough sun, enough water, et cetera, pretty much all the farmers do about the same, plus or minus. When there's a drought, the farmers that didn't degrade their land do OK. Don't do great, but they do OK. While the farmers that did erode their soils, et cetera, default on their loans. So this is a way for the bank to mitigate their own financial risk. But if this actually happens and gets promoted around the world, this could be huge for agriculture. So, and then China, as a country, is also, there's a lot to be said about China, positive and negative. In this case, though, the top leadership is really pushing the idea of what they call green mountains instead of mountains of silver and gold. In China, the mayors actually have a lot of power, um, and there is still resistance, so this may take a while. But as we know, in China, when something is decided, it happens almost over, overnight, relatively. So it's, it's moving forward. So. I really like this comic because I feel like this is the situation we're in, where this guy here is saying, you know, we need energy independence, all this great stuff, and this back row hackler is saying, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> Let's just create the better world and deal with that. Um, 
The SA ASAP has been mentioned quite a few times. You guys should check out the website. Um, it's basically trying to create sort of an alliance of different organizations and different alliances. Um, so the website's right here. Many of you have probably also heard of Solutions. It's a publication that Bob and I started um, in about 2010 where it looks at whole system solutions. So one third of every article can be about a problem, but two thirds has to be about a solution. So take a look, it's free online. Um, web URL right there, and thank you. Sorry.